the IEA's fifth annual global conference on energy efficiency. I'm very pleased so many of you can join us by live stream from many parts of the world. You're all very welcome. My name is Brian Motherway. I'm the head of energy efficiency here at the IEA. And it's a great pleasure to have you all with us. It's a great pleasure to have such an esteemed and learned panel of speakers and discussants that we're going to hear from over the next 90 minutes to discuss issues that we, in fact, have been discussing all day in all of the sessions of the Global Conference, where we've been teasing out issues about energy efficiency, its role in job creation, its role in economic stimulus, its central role in clean energy transitions and decarbonisation, and the kind of policies and actions that are required for it to play that role. And of course, of course, this comes in the context of the release yesterday of the 10 recommendations of the Global Commission for Urgent Action on Energy Efficiency. And I want to thank the members of the Commission, including Michael, who we'll be hearing from later, who is a very active and important member of the Commission. And we heard from a number of Commission members over the course of the day, including heads of state, ministers, CEOs, and many of the people we asked to generously share their time over the last year to think about how can we uh, make stronger progress on energy efficiency through actions that deliver faster and stronger benefits. And of course, the work became more current than ever uh, in the second half of the period when the COVID crisis uh, created many challenges for all governments, uh, most immediately a, a health and well-being crisis, but of course, with a very significant economic uh, crisis to follow. And of course, many countries are focused now very firmly on re-stimulating their economies and hopefully looking to energy efficiency for the role it can play. And I would commend the recommendations of the Global Commission for talks on how that can be uh, achieved in an urgent and strong way. Now, uh, I want to say to our audience in particular, we're keen to have you participate uh, in this session. So uh, first of all, you are very welcome to send us any questions you may have for anybody you hear from this evening. And you can do so by sending to that to the email address that you see on the screen now, which is energy.efficiency at IEA.org. So please do send us your questions and we will pass them on to the uh, panel during the course of the discussion. Also, if you're on social media, we'd love to hear from you using the hashtag Efficiency2020. And there's been some nice discussions over the course of the day on Twitter and other platforms, and you're very welcome to join that. Finally, to make things even more interactive, I'd like to start with a, an opinion poll. Uh, and you can participate in this poll by going to the website menti.com. There's no need to register or log on or whatever. You can simply pick up your smartphone, go to menti.com, and you can put in the code 541756. And if you do that, you will see the following question. So this is just to, to this is more a test of loyalty. Uh, we'll come back to tease out your knowledge later on. But the first question we have for you is, how many sessions of the Global Efficiency Conference have you joined today? So we'd be keen to see how many of you are joining us for the first time, particularly from other time zones, or many, how many of you have been to a number of sessions. So if you go to menti.com, you can uh, join the poll there and tell us how many sessions uh, and we'll be interested to see. So I think you can see on the screen now, we're starting to see some responses. Some people claim to have been at all six, but that may be members of my team sitting here uh, after a long day. But it's nice to see that many people say they have been at most of the sessions, uh, some people a couple, and for a number of people, this is their first session, and you're very welcome. And of course, the purpose of today's conference and the way we did it, a little bit of an experiment, is to see how can we engage a global audience in lots of countries, lots of time zones, with lots of perspectives in what really is a global conversation about energy efficiency, how can we accelerate progress, and how can we learn from each other? And that's been a key theme across the day about encouraging countries to look to what others are doing in the public and private sector, learn from best practice in finance, learn from best practice in business, and of course, learn from best practice in policy making and government. And we have seen lots of that fruitful exchange today, and we hope to continue it now. So let's get started with our great keynote speakers. Um, first of all, it's a particular 
privilege and pleasure to welcome the uh, Minister Seamus O'Regan, who's a Canadian Minister of Natural Resources, a strong advocate of many of the issues we're going to talk about today, and also a strong friend and colleague for the IEA. So, Minister O'Regan, we're very pleased that you're able to join us, uh, what I would say is this evening for us and this morning for you, and I'm very happy to pass the floor to you, Minister. Thank you very much, Brian. Mid-afternoon, actually, here. Uh, on the island of Newfoundland. And I, I want to thank you and, and your team. I know it's not easy for a good Irishman to suffer through the, the Paris heat. Uh, difficult, we're not built for it. Um, but I want to thank you nonetheless. And, and I want to thank, you know, uh, Fadi Birol and the entire team. I see the IE quoted in The Economist, in the FT, in every periodical I seem to pick up. And that's a good thing, uh, obviously, because your thoughtful leadership, I think, through this unprecedented period, is being noticed, and that is to be commended. Um, the IEA has called energy efficiency uh, our first fuel, the world's first fuel, and, and rightly so. Uh, I think at least 40%, 40% of the actions required for countries to meet the Paris goals can come from energy efficiency. Um, it may not get the same attention, um, but it is more than the share for renewables. Uh, and it accounts for more than one third of Canada's planned emission uh, reductions to reach our Paris commitment. Efficiency will help us meet the world's increased demand for energy. It will help our economies recover because every penny saved by families and businesses through efficiency measures will, will help them. And every job that's created in the industry will have a positive impact. And it will help small and, and medium sized enterprises that dominate the energy efficiency sector. It's a smart investment. Um, energy efficiency is at the nexus of the economy and the environment. It is good for the climate. It is good for our pocketbooks, uh, while also being a tremendous job creator. In Canada, about 436,000 people work in energy efficiency related jobs. It's about one in 50 Canadians. Uh, the statistics are, are similar, I think, in many of the countries uh, around the world, um, certainly the ones that are present here, I believe. And, Energy efficiency, energy efficiency jobs have a significant impact on local economies. They're spread out uh, throughout our countries, both urban and rural. Our government has provided support to the energy efficiency sector through wage subsidies and interest-free loan programs. We've also introduced and amplified training programs for current and future workers to enter the sector. Uh, last year, we invested an additional $1 billion on energy efficiency measures in our cities and our communities uh, to further improve energy efficiency in homes and buildings through financing mechanisms and partnerships. Um, buildings are responsible, as many of you know, for some of our highest emissions. It's an area where we can make significant uh, and I think very quick progress. Uh, but given the financial stresses that many families and businesses are under right now uh, during this lockdown period throughout much of the globe, home energy improvements and large building retrofits may not be as affordable uh, as they were, or perhaps even top of mind for many. So we need to make existing retrofit programs, I think, more accessible. We're doing this through the establishment of green, green banks to crowd in private sector investment in, in uh, deep building retrofits and to enable broad uptake of home energy retrofits. And we're providing free home energy audits and up to $40,000 in interest-free lending for retrofits to further accelerate that activity. I'm convinced that making smarter individual choices will help us achieve bigger collective results, you know, better appliances, better light bulbs, better windows, better building codes, better cars, uh, more and more of these, they add up. Um, it, I call it radical incrementalism. Um, but cumulatively and very quickly, which is key, uh, it'll be far more effective, I think, than any one single revolutionary technology that I think we you know, sometimes hope will save us all. Um, as I imparted upon my colleagues in the world, uh, the World Economic Forum session yesterday, we must resolve to be inclusive. We must resolve that people do not feel left behind as we drive our post-COVID recovery and advance our commitments to net zero. Change can overwhelm people and, and they're already right now dealing with so much, encouraging them to be part of the change in their homes, in their places of work. It involves people in a meaningful way. Uh, Fatih Birol has wisely cited this time as an opportunity to make those smart investments um, to transition to lower emitting economies. 
Inclusivity, I would add, is the key to maintaining that green stimulus momentum because those who are left behind will cling to the familiar and they will choose governments rooted in the status quo. They will resist the urgency of this climate crisis. They will resist the change that is vital to confronting it. And they will resist the need for governments to be ambitious. Our mission must be a shared one to build a more prosperous, more sustainable, more innovative economy that does not leave people behind or indeed lead whole, leave whole countries behind. People vote and leaving some behind could set us all back. Inclusion requires goodwill. It requires good open minds. It requires determination of us all and it will be hard work. How we balance the urgency of combating climate change with new post-COVID demands for a more equitable and shared prosperity is the challenge of our age. Um, that challenge can only be met if people are not left behind, but instead feel that they are part of the answer. Increasing energy efficiency involves people. It can lead this charge, this charge of a just energy transition. Thank you, Brian. Thank you all. Thank you indeed, Minister, for those very inspiring words. And it's easy to see, listening to you speak, why Canada is such a strong voice and leader in this field. And I think the theme you, you talk about there, about the connection between clean energy and just transition is really essential. And your point is very well made. And I may just ask you as a brief follow-up, while talking about the general connections be, uh, between well-being in communities and, and making, looking after the social development and well-being of citizens and clean energy uh, in general, what are the specifics of the role energy efficiency can play in terms of supporting communities and workers and helping a just transition? Well, Brian, uh, you know, again, the key is to focus, and this has been key for us uh, in this recovery period, it, the key has been focusing on people. Uh, they are at the center of, of our energy transition and energy efficiency can play an important part of this. As I said, inclusivity, I think, is everything. Um, people need to feel that they are part of the transition and, and not feel that they're left behind. Uh, the good news for us uh, is that employment growth in energy efficiency has been outpacing the economy-wide average in Canada. And before COVID-19, many businesses were experiencing significant difficulties in finding uh, enough qualified workers. So we've increased training opportunities to develop energy efficiency skills, for example, in home retrofitting. Um, we're working with training and trade organizations and unions and Canada's national uh, efficiency research and advocacy body, which is Efficiency Canada, to pivot to online training during the pandemic so that efficiency workers can upgrade as the economy reopens. And so we can uh, introduce more workers to, to this incredibly uh, strong and growing area. Um, with with a notion of, of you know particularly looking at uh, those who are underrepresented uh, in, in the sector, um, and you know particularly I'm thinking of, of indigenous communities, rural communities, um, and uh, racialized minorities. Um, you know there there is tremendous room for growth in making sure that people are properly represented, and and we're attracting those new entrants. Um, you know before the the pandemic. You know, to see that job growth was 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 fantastic. It was something that you know, had I been giving the speech under normal times, I would I, I would still give the speech. But now we've amplified things because we we see that growth, and we want Canadians, Canadian businesses, to be ready to take advantage of of the recovery, the recovery that we will set on on I think new terms. Um, and the energy efficiency sector, uh, as I said, it's important because it's both urban and rural and it's local. It is in people's communities. It is as close as the homes that they live in and the buildings that they work in. That's its tremendous advantage. Minister Regan, thank you very much indeed. That, that's very useful and thank you for answering that question. Let me turn now to our second keynote speaker, which is uh, Mr. Gerasimos Tomas, the Deputy Minister for Environment and Energy of Greece. Uh, Minister Tomas, we're very pleased that you're able to join us and I now hand the floor over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you and congratulations uh, uh, to uh, IEA. I want to add my congratulations to the wonderful job you're doing in uh, analysis and also in uh, uh, educating and distributing your results and educating uh, policy makers and normal people about the importance of energy saving. Um, even before the COVID crisis for Greece, energy efficiency initiatives were at the core of our national strategy uh, for energy and climate. 
we had set uh, uh, at the end of last year important ambitious ambitious targets for 2030. We uh, set out to reduce our final, final energy consumption by more than 38% compared to the 2007 forecasts and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 56% compared to 2005. Along these lines, our goal has been to ensure the development of energy policies that foster growth and uh, to challenge uh, uh, high energy prices and make sure that the costs uh, of the greener economy come down so that we have an overall uh, energy reduction cost in the economy. And we have uh, built an integrated plan that uh, reduces energy consumption with the building sector and the transport sector at the uh, center of our, uh, of our action. Now, uh, the COVID crisis has, uh, uh, in a certain way, uh, had went very well for Greece. We had a few victims and we are thankful for that. And we have been proactive in handling that. And at the same time, we recognize that uh, energy efficiency uh, actions uh, is an area where we can uh, profit and accelerate post-COVID crisis. This is an area that can boost economic activity, boost employment, and it can take advantage of our uh, supply chain, Greek, European, and very solid and diversified supply chain, which makes the implementations of actions uh, uh, you know, very solid. We need to implement things and take actions post-COVID that can happen and they cannot uh, have uh, um, blockages in the supply chain. So this is an important reason for our priority to energy efficiency first, also post-COVID and as part of our recovery strategy. This uh, approach is fully aligned with the EU-European Union strategy. You had the European Commissioner for Energy uh, in the panel earlier on. The European Green Deal and the recurb and renovation wave, uh, putting an emphasis on renovation of buildings, uh, is at the center of the European policy. And we, in Greece, uh, we plan to um, uh, also take advantage of this uh, for Greece, Buildings consume 40% of our final energy and are responsible for 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. And there is an important source of savings uh, in terms of emissions that we can do. And we are looking forward to launch new instruments in order to accelerate our action. But uh, uh, let's uh, uh, get an, a feeling of, of the numbers, what we were uh, set out to do. I mean, in order to achieve the targets that I just mentioned of, of reducing uh, uh, final energy consumption by 38%, in order to achieve that, we had set out to um, uh, upgrade uh, in terms of buildings about 15% of our buildings over the next decade. And this would require, uh, together with actions outside buildings on the industry and elsewhere, the total investment in energy efficiency for Greece over the next decade would be around 8 billion. Uh, just to put that into perspective, over the last decade, over the last nine years, Greece has spent about 1.3 billion euros to renovate around 130,000 dwellings. It's a, and uh, uh, we need to increase the efficiency and the leverage of this money in order to reach targets that go to 15% of the stock of buildings that we have in the economy. So we started, uh, the, the numbers uh, indicate that uh, both in Greece, but also in Europe, we need to not only accelerate the action, but we need to increase the leverage of the money that we get out of energy efficiency schemes. And I give you an example from the tourist sector. As you know, it's very important for Greece. It has a high seasonality. And, uh, you know, it's responsible for 160 um, kilograms of CO2 per square meter per annum, per square meter. So uh, we have an annual energy bill in the, uh, energy in the tourist sector of 550 million euro. And uh, there is significant potential in reducing uh, uh, 
the energy uh, cost and in, uh, the CO, CO2 emissions from the tourist building stock uh, with uh, targeted actions. So uh, the numbers uh, are good. That's one good thing about this um, energy efficiency. We do have numbers. We have advanced in Europe and in Greece in uh, quantifying what we have to do. Uh, but uh, the resources, if you think of the challenge of renovating the building stock, uh, the resources needed are enormous. Um, and uh, the population, the industry, all the sectors are not uh, fully familiar with the economic and financial value of the energy savings. So we plan to proceed uh, uh, in two steps, uh, in, in two ways. Uh, one way is to now, as part of the post-COVID strategy, uh, to boost, uh, let's say, the resources available for what I call more classical programs, programs to renovating uh, households, uh, uh, apartments, or individual households. This is a program that we run very well, and we plan to, uh, uh, you know, give different incentives uh, to go beyond the classical renovation, we need to uh, make uh, homes smarter in order to achieve uh, uh, better energy efficiency uh, targets than the ones that we have with simple insulation or changing of the heating system. So we need to go into a prosumer approach that the uh, uh, you know uh, house, uh, the family or the house owner manages the energy system of. Uh, uh, his or her uh, home. And we need also to promote uh, uh, energy independence with uh, photovoltaic or uh, other sources of renewable energy and uh, domestic storage. So the system of energy efficiency and the interventions on energy efficiency on buildings are gradually being combined with, uh, uh, let's say, interventions that create smarter homes and more independent, energy independent homes. This is uh, done initially, will be done through uh, traditional instruments that combine uh, uh, grants with loans and reach out to the population for uh, private uh, uh, households, but also for industrial buildings and um, you know, um, public buildings. And the uh, second uh, uh, approach is to develop more innovative instruments. We plan to uh, boost our energy efficiency obligation schemes. They are, uh, uh, let's say, uh, provided for by European law, but about 20% of our um, energy um, efficiency targets have, has to be reached through obligation schemes uh, that are um, operated by energy providers and uh, distribution network providers. So we integrate the energy efficiency goal into the whole system. And uh, we will go beyond that uh, for the energy savings of buildings. We will have auctioning procedures. We will auction, uh, um, let's say, a certain amount of money against which, you know, ESCOs can provide uh, a certain uh, uh, amount of buildings and interventions in buildings that will, and they will compete, compete the different ESCOs, they will compete on the amount of saving that uh, uh, they will deliver. So we start with the classical instruments, which is grant and loan combination. And then as we move into the decade, we will integrate the energy saving in the functioning of the energy providers, the incentives and the uh, you know uh, penalties that the energy uh, providers, the energy suppliers uh, uh, have to uh, um, uh, offer in the electricity market or in the gas market, and that way I think we can gradually increase the leverage and increase the efficiency of the energy efficiency measures. So um, uh, we need to be innovative uh, in our schemes, but we need to keep pace with uh, um, uh, uh, you know, good results that can demonstrate to a larger part of the population and the business community that energy efficiency pays off. This is at the center of what we are planning to achieve. 
but it is uh, 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 not fully acknowledged yet uh, by the business community or the individuals. And that is why the work of the IEA in this area is extremely useful. Minister, thank you very much. It's very comprehensive and it's, it's very interesting to hear the range of activities you are focusing on. And I think you are exactly right to focus on investment. And if I might just ask you a brief question, given the, that investment is at the center of energy efficiency, how much has the landscape for investment, be it public or private, changed because of the crisis? How, how has your thinking changed about driving investment into energy efficiency because of the situation we find ourselves in today? I think uh, uh, in terms of uh, investment, I think the crisis has uh, increased the understanding and the acceptance that uh, investment is necessary. But I think uh, in the very short term, it has um, somehow uh, reduced the capacity of the private investment, uh, you know, to deliver results uh, in this area. Take tourism. Uh, you know, we were planning to have a so-called more leveraged uh, instrument for uh, energy renovation in tourist dwellings. Of course, as they are closed, we cannot expect uh, too much private participation. So in the short term, you know, 20, as we come out of the crisis 2020, 2021, potentially 2022, uh, you know, uh, both public finances in some of the countries are strained and the private investors are strained. So we need to, uh, you know, kickstart, let's say, a new uh, wave of interventions that uh, rely at a different mix of public-private investments. But it is important to uh, keep uh, the private investment in the picture. Energy efficiency pays off. It has a high capex at the beginning. And uh, that is what we need to educate people on how to take this longer term approach. I think overall, with the help of the EU, uh, uh, European Union recovery action and package, uh, I hope we will be able also in countries like Greece, where we have a high, uh, let's say, public debt and limited uh, fiscal capacity, we will be able to jumpstart the energy efficiency investment and gradually move to instruments that provide higher and higher levels. I think uh, uh, after three or four years, it will be evident that the uh, public intervention uh, in, in, such, um, in this field uh, has to be uh, limited. Thank you very much, Minister. That's very useful to, to hear that perspective. Let me turn now to our third keynote speaker, who is Madame Leticia Guterres, who is Director General of Policy Coordination in the Ministry of Environment for the Government of Mexico City. And before handing to Madame Guterres, I want to just uh, let our uh, panelists and audience know that Mexico has suffered an earthquake today. And uh, I want to say to you, Madame Guterres, two things. First of all, on behalf of all my colleagues, and all of our participants, we express our solidarity for the difficulties you're facing. And secondly, a particularly sincere thank you for finding uh, the capacity to join this discussion. We really appreciate you, you managing to join us despite the difficulties. And with that, I'd like to hand the floor over to you. Yes, I think we can thank hear you now. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. Thank you for, for your words. Uh, it's indeed uh, uh, this earthquake struck Mexico City this morning and uh, we didn't want to uh, lose this opportunity to join this global discussion despite Minister Robles and a uh, Mayor Sheinbaum uh, couldn't be uh, in, in this discussion uh, right now. They are part of the emergency protocol the, the city is undertaking uh, right now. So, um, 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 okay, so I'll start. It's, it's a, we're in crisis in the city, so it's a, a, a bit difficult, but um, uh, so um, um, we, we think it's very, very important to, to start reflecting on the paths, uh, the energy paths and the development paths the city uh, needs to follow, especially right now, in this time where all attention is, um, is focused on the epidemic and its effects on health. 
uh, well-being of of the of of all our, our um, citizens and its economic impact. Uh, and we must think about ensuring a, a better future uh, for our city. Uh, for a long time, Mexico City was considered one of the most polluted places on earth, and we have been fighting to change that, both the condition and the image of the city. And we, we are certain that an energy transition and energy efficiency measures are part of this effort. Uh, Mexico City is the fifth economy in Latin America. Uh, we have uh, 8 million inhabitants, but we have 20 million people living around the metropolitan area, which actually is a huge pressure for Mexico City because uh, more than 8 million people actually live and work uh, in Mexico City uh, during around uh, 15 hours a day. Um, uh, we are also very pleased to be part of these global discussions and, uh, and the discussion around the role of subnational actors uh, to meet the Paris goal. We are also um, very conscious that uh, as a role of, uh, in Mexico City, we have an important um, a contribution to, to meet the Paris goal. Uh, our city's governmental program aims to create and, rebu and rebuild these sustainable con conditions for the city. And uh, the program was designed based on that aspiration and bringing together uh, the, the city, their inhabitants uh, dream. So uh, this uh, governmental program has um, a series of sectoral policies, programs and projects that recognize uh, as the planetary boundaries model, we have a boundaries uh, model for the city in which we um, recognize uh, these ecological boundaries needed to maintain and recover these environmental services and conditions essential for the city, but also the social and human rights that we need to guarantee, promote, respect and defend. Uh, in this sense, we know that there is no sustainable city without equality, equity, inclusion and well-being for each of the people who inhabit it. Um, as part of this uh, uh, city's environmental improvement, we draw up seven strategic lines for which a long list of project, projects has followed. And I would like to highlight two of them that have uh, specific uh, actions and very ambitious uh, strategies around uh, energy efficiency. One of them is the solar city strategy. And the second one is the sustainable transport uh, strategy with a very uh, uh, special focus on the public transport system. Um, in terms of emission, the city uh, emit the, the, um, the sector that emit emits the most uh, greenhouse gas emissions is first the transport sector, which around 70% of the emissions, and secondly, the energy sector, mainly electricity use. Um, around 80% of, of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, comes from energy sectors uh, in the subsectors of residential, industrial, and commercial. And 70% of the energy used in Mexico City uh, uh, comes for fo from fossil fuel uh, um, uh, sources. So that's why uh, uh, the, the, this solar city strategy is key for our development of the city. Um, uh, regarding this uh, strategy, uh, I can say that um, we are working uh, to transform all public buildings into solar generators and consumers. We have around uh, public buildings, 2,500 buildings in Mexico City that will uh, uh, have solar genera uh, generation and energy efficiency measures. This is a quite a uh, challenge because most of these buildings are, are historic buildings and uh, there are challenges associated with retrofitting that kind of buildings. Uh, for that, we are working with building administrations to build up capacities so they can share information because they are the ones who decide how to maintain uh, the buildings, how and, and uh, how to buy the energy, etc. Uh, strengthening monitoring and reporting systems for these uh, uh, public buildings and um, uh, emphasizing the health and productivity case around all the social benefits uh, that energy efficiency measured inside public buildings can bring uh, to people who work inside this building. Um, we are also promoting a new regulation on uh, uh, that from now on, all private buildings, new private buildings in the city 
must include solar generation for their electric consumption, as well as energy efficiency measures. And we are um, a, a, um, a inviting and, and a, a incentivizing that uh, mostly passive energy efficiency measures from the design of the building are, in, uh, are included. Uh, with a special, a special focus on green infrastructure, which uh, has a double benefit for the city because it also helps us uh, to mitigate the urban heat island effect in Mexico City. Uh, a significant percentage also of our subway system consumes energy generated uh, already by, by clean sources. Uh, and, and we are also uh, um, implementing energy efficiency uh, measures. Um, we are working also with uh, two rural communities in Mexico City to plan the creation for solar farms so we can um, provide a clean energy to the, to, to the metro system and um, promoting the creation of new cooperatives and private enterprises, joint ventures to generate this uh, rene renewable energy. Um, the second uh, strategic line that I would like to highlight is the, the work we have been doing in transport. Uh, which is mainly focused on our public transport system. As I said, this is the first source of emissions in, uh, um, in Mexico City and is one of the main strategy for climate mitigation. Uh, our um, sustainable transport system perspective uh, has changed um, uh, um, on how the city prioritizes uh, infra infrastructure upgrades. We are now investing more in the lowest income zones in the city as our main attention, since they are the ones who spend the most uh, time in transportation, the people who live in these outer boroughs uh, uh, from uh, downtown Mexico City. Uh, all public transportation investment is, um, is, uh, is thought to, to be both, to make our city easier, to, 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 to be more accessible, particularly for these outer districts and to lower the city's carbon footprint, footprint but with a specific uh, focus on uh, accessibility. Uh, we are, to give you some examples, we are building four cable car routes, uh, cablebus, as we call it in Spanish, that will connect the remote mountainous population with the subway system. And these routes will extend uh, up to 38 kilometers in four different boroughs. The Metrobus uh, circuit, which is an exclusive lane articulated bus network, is expanding with six new routes that already include uh, um, uh, um, improvements in energy efficiency uh, uh, compared to the old uh, lanes and 20 kilometers added further uh, link the rural southernmost part of the city. Uh, also, the subway, the metro, is fully modernizing and catching up on maintenance, both in its train system and energy sources. And we are modernizing and expanding the electric trolleybus network with, with 50, uh, uh, sorry, 500 new units. Uh, we have realized that in most of the public transport system, energy efficiency measures are related to good quality maintenance, which seems uh, very simple and very easy, but it's not, no? With few tweaks here and there in maintenance uh, 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 measures, we can improve energy efficiency uh, uh, by a lot. Uh, another example is that we already have 63 new 100% electric buses that are now used uh, in one of the city's busiest routes and provide service to 2,000 users an hour in rush hour. And, um, we are also investing and tripling our infrastructure bike lanes from 200 kilometers to 600 uh, kilometers in the city. Uh, finally, we are also expanding hybrid and electric vehicle incentives specifically for taxis uh, through innovative uh, financial mechanisms. Um, I would say that Mexico City, like every big city uh, and a big consumer, because we are a huge, we are a megalopolis, a huge consumer of energy has to have energy efficiency at, at its core of the climate uh, policy and development policy of our city. We are full of enormous challenges, but also great hopes. And uh, our current policy now takes advantages of also these opportunities of the, of the city. We, we, um, uh, we hope uh, that uh, we can achieve all these targets uh, and embody again 
Humboldt's description of our city in the 19th century as the most transparent uh, region. And we work to ensure a city of innovation, inclusiveness, and equality, a safe city. Thank you. Madame Guterres, thank you very, very much indeed. And when we hear your impressive remarks, it's easy to understand why Mexico City just earlier this month was the winner of the prestigious One Plan Planet City Challenge Award, beating over 250 cities from around the world. So many congratulations on that achievement. And if I could ask a, a quick follow-up question, because listening to your remarks, it seems that one of the secrets of your, of your success is how how well you have managed to get different agencies and parts of the city government working together to achieve these goals. And maybe you could share with our audience some, some learnings on, on how to go about getting that kind of joined up cooperation across different parts of the government. Thank you. Um, I would highlight um, four points. First of all, I would say that uh, we have a very strong leadership uh, and clarity about uh, the role of energy efficiency uh, and uh, uh, clean energy, et cetera, and a climate policy, policy from the top of our government. Our chief of government, uh, Mrs. Claudia Sheinbaum, uh, she's uh, the, the greatest climate champion in the city. And that's definitely one of the key elements for all the governments and the different secretariats and the different entities of, of our uh, government to get together to pursue the same goal. So that's, that's key. She has it very clear and motivates uh, all of the cabinets to, to um, uh, work towards a, a climate uh, resilient uh, and, and climate neutral city. Uh, second, uh, we have maintained a very strong cooperation link with all academic and research institutions in Mexico. Uh, we have the, um, um, the positive uh, uh, aspect that here in Mexico City, we have most of the uh, high level institution and research centers of uh, Mexico as a country, uh, but not only with national, but international uh, academic and research institutions. And we, we have uh, um, made uh, and designed policies and taken decisions uh, with a clear uh, uh, based, science-based, uh, uh, information. Uh, third, uh, we have also collaborated with uh, other cities uh, around the globe and uh, have intensified our communications and shared our lessons learned uh, with cities and regions, states that are experiencing similar problems or have similar aspirations towards sustainability and, and specifically energy efficiency in building and in, in the service sector. And this includes uh, cities from the United States, Europe, Latin America, and Asia. And that's why we celebrate uh, the invitation to this global uh, uh, dialogues because we consider that this is very important for us to, to learn and to improve the policies we're implementing. And fourth, uh, um, uh, We may have lost our connection there at the fourth point. So I think we've lost Madame Guterres, but uh, again, on, on behalf of everybody, I will express, first of all, our thanks to her for joining us. And secondly, our best wishes to her, her colleagues and her compatriots on this difficult day. And I think you'll agree, uh, it's very impressive to see what Mexico City is doing uh, in, and in terms of the lessons it can teach us all. So I want to thank our three keynote speakers for inspiring remarks. I know some of them may need to leave us now, but of course, you're welcome to stay if you'd like to continue to participate. Uh, but we're going to move now to our panel discussion. Uh, it, just in the transition, I would like to involve our audience in one more question uh, using the Menti poll. So I'm going to ask you to uh, refer to your smartphones uh, one more time and look at menti.com. Uh, and then if you haven't logged in already, you can log in using the six digit code that is on the screen now, uh, which is 541. 756. And because our theme is about new approaches to energy efficiency action, we would be interested in your views on the question which you can see on your screen now, which is, in which area do you think innovative approaches 
can have the most impact. So as you'll see from our panel discussion in a minute, where this idea of innovation and new approaches applies to finance, it applies to technology, it applies to policy making. Uh, so we're keen to hear where you think uh, more innovation might have the most impact. And you could answer that uh, we're looking really at sectors here, such as building and construction, industry, finance, transport, smart meters and apps, uh, and devices and data analytics. So you have six choices there. And I think you can see on the screen as votes come in, uh, they will change order a little bit. Uh, so do please uh, go to menti.com and I'll just give that a minute there for you to express your views. Well, you know, I think it's good to see that the answer is everything. We have quite a very even spread. Billings and construction is slightly ahead, but I think we can say that there's a sense of that innovation has a value and a role to play in every sector. Uh, and I think that is something that we're going to discuss now in the next section when we turn to our four panel discussions. Uh, and I'm very pleased we have such uh, great panelists to join us. I want to thank them all for joining us. And what I'm going to do is introduce them each in turn ask them to say a few opening remarks that maybe gives us a context of who they are and where they come from, uh, any key points they want to raise. But I would encourage you panelists to keep those opening remarks brief and that will give us time to get into some discussion. And I would remind our audience that you can send in questions for our panel by emailing to them to energy.efficiency at iea.org. So please do send in your questions and we will put them to the panelists in front of us. So let me start, first of all, uh, with Andrew McDowell, who's the vice president of the European Investment Bank, a key player in the area of energy efficiency investment in this part of the world, uh, and very active in some of the recent developments we're seeing in both policy and finance terms. So, Andrew, thank you very much indeed for joining us. And I'll hand over to you for your opening remarks. Uh, good evening from Luxembourg, Brian. Can you hear me okay? Perfectly well, thank you. Uh, well, greetings uh, where we're, we're celebrating uh, the National Day of Luxembourg. It's the official birthday of the Grand Duke, but uh, unfortunately all the festivities have been cancelled, which is why I'm delighted to join you uh, at the annual IEA Energy Efficiency Conference. Listen, just, just some brief interventions. I mean, it, it, look, it's very clear from the interventions of the, uh, of the policymakers that you know, investment in energy efficiency can in some ways be the perfect stimulus uh, post-COVID-19. You know, it should be able to be delivered relatively quickly. There's investment opportunities everywhere, every city, town and village. It's obviously labor intensive and uses the resources from a, from a sector construction that's been particularly hard hit by the crisis. It's got a good long-term economic return and puts, puts us on a path towards a carbon neutrality and obviously it directly benefits those, including 50 million Europeans, by the way, and a number that's growing because of the crisis, who often have to choose between eating, eating and heating. So, um, so it's, a, it's the obvious area to focus on uh, for, for a stimulus. Now, having said that, it's not going to be easy to do so, and we all know why. I mean, as well as the usual obstacles facing energy efficiency investment of weak economic incentives due to low, and indeed at the moment, declining energy prices and a lack of carbon pricing, split incentives between tenants and landlords, consumer myopia and inertia, limited te technical expertise and so on. We, in addition to those usual obstacles, we now also face, as a result of the crisis, a more difficult financing environment. I mean, as you, as you know, energy efficiency finance have traditionally been mostly self-financed through homeowners' personal savings and companies' own balance sheets. But of course, depleted household and corporate cash balances as a result of the crisis mean more external financing for energy efficiency investment is going to be required in the form of grants, loans and equity. And one has to wonder whether the financial markets are really ready to respond. I mean, most banks 
are already facing severe declines in profitability, and energy efficiency financing is still not perceived as a very lucrative business and a focus of management attention. So that's a bit depressing. So what is EIB doing to try and help? Okay, so, well, a, a number of things I just mentioned briefly. Firstly, um, because of the crisis situation, we're willing now to finance much, a much greater proportion of eligible projects than traditionally. In fact, up to 90% compared to our usual 50% requirement, reducing third-party financing requirements. Secondly, we're working much more intensively with governments in Europe on their national energy and climate plans and are willing, to, again, through traditional public sector lending, to, to lower the cost of the implementation of those plans. Thirdly, we're really trying to build up the ESCO market in Europe, Brian. I mean, this is something that still hasn't taken off in the way it's taken off in the United States and Asia. Uh, we're providing not just equity and debt finance to promoters, but also advice on model contracts, government accounting treatment, technical and financial structuring, and so on. Fourthly, we're, we're really trying to support the most ambitious public and private housing bodies across Europe to develop not just retrofit, but obviously also new construction that's near or net zero uh, energy emitting. We're really also trying to make it much more profitable and interesting for commercial banks to develop specific energy efficiency products for SMEs and households, both through low cost funding, but also through risk sharing and capital relief project, uh, products. And in this regard, we really need to rebuild up the securitization and market in Europe to, to, to allow the capital markets to help support the investments that are required. And then finally, of course, we're working really closely with the commission on blended finance, how to bring EU funds, national funds, structural funds to, together with the DIB balance sheet into a single mix that lowers the cost of capital, but that is also much less bureaucratic uh, to deploy for, for the end promoters by harmonizing eligibilities and rules. These are the things we're working on at the moment, Brian. We think um, it's a big challenge, but if, 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 if a bank, a public bank like the European Investment Bank doesn't invest the time and effort to build up this market, uh, it's, go it's, going to be, it's going to be difficult to do. Thanks very much. Thank you indeed, Andrew. And there's a few points I'd like to come back to later in the discussion, but I'm going to jump in straight away to a question we got from the audience because you touched on energy prices. And the question, paraphrasing, is on the one hand, the value of efficiency has never been greater in terms of its job creation potential. And Dr. Fatih Baral earlier described it as a job machine and its role in stimulus. But on the other hand, as you said, energy prices are low and we're probably going to see historically low gas prices in particular for quite some time. So how do those two play out in terms of the prospects for energy efficiency? Well, um, I mean, you know, we have to respond in one of two ways. Um, uh, either the cost of finance has to come down, and uh, again, the EIB can help. I mean, if, you know, if the return on capital from energy efficiency projects is declining, the cost of finance has to decline in order to, uh, to, to, to continue to make it interesting for investment promoters. Or indeed, we have to increase the return through, uh, through carbon pricing and um, by adequately reflecting um, you know, uh, by adequately reflecting the, the social costs and environmental costs of, um, of fossil fuel consumption. I mean, I think, I, I think what we are seeing, in fact, in, in, in a, certainly in a lot of EU countries, is political discussion about the opportunity to use the recent decline in fossil fuel prices uh, to start carbon pricing more aggressively. I mean, I'm quite, I'm quite enthused by uh, by the fact that I think this has become a mainstream proposition now. And uh, there's a long way to go. Um, but I certainly think, you know, we, we now see in about 20 out of 27 European countries, we see some start to, uh, to carbon pricing outside of the emissions trading system. Uh, I also think the reforms that the Commission put in place a couple of years ago, about three years ago in the emissions trading system, have really worked well this, in this crisis to stop the price of carbon from completely crashing. Uh, you'll recall after the financial and banking crisis 10 years ago, the price of carbon completely crashed and it really damaged the incipient growth in energy efficiency financing at that time. So the reforms that have been put in place in the last few years have stopped that happening. It's given the commission more flexibility to withdraw allowances when demand, when demand falls. And I, th I think that's actually giving 
promoters a lot of confidence um, that they can invest against a reasonable carbon price floor effectively over the next 10 to 15 years. So some, so, some, some signs of, uh, some signs of uh, new approaches in carbon pricing, but look, a long way to go. Thanks very much, Andrew. Let me go to our second panelist now. And it's a great pleasure to introduce Alex uh, Fitzsimmons, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Department of Energy mm -hmm. in the United States government. And uh, he is Mr. Energy Efficiency in the DOE. So we're very <laughs> lucky to have him with us. And Alex, uh, I'm going to turn to you now, uh, welcome you and ask you to make your opening remarks. All right. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, kudos to you and, and your team for powering through, literally powering through uh, an entire day of uh, successful, successful panels. I know it's, um, it's no easy feat, particularly in, in challenging times like these. I remember being at the, the global conference last year with our uh, undersecretary, Mark Menzies, uh, in, in, uh, in Dublin during IEA um, Energy Efficiency Week. Um, and it's, it's, it's truly a testament to the the resiliency of, of your team that you're able to adapt so quickly. So I um, hope all of you are, are doing well and staying safe during what we know are, are very challenging times that a number of the speakers have, have mentioned. So I'm gonna keep this very brief uh, and, and really welcome the opportunity to have a discussion and take questions. But you, know, you heard several of the other speakers, both in the keynote session and the panel session, talk about um, financial, innovation, a business model innovation, which are important. And, um, but I'm going to focus on two other forms of innovation or new approaches to energy efficiency, which are uh, technological innovation and policy innovation. And I think these two areas, particularly taken together, um, represent why the United States has been so successful from an energy standpoint. Uh, taking a, a, a broad view of the, the energy situation around the world recent months, notwithstanding. You know, uh, as all of you know, that the United States is both the uh, number one producer of oil and natural gas in the world, and we're also leading the world in reducing energy related CO2 emissions. And uh, a lot of people will wonder oh, how, how can you do both, right? We get, uh, we get a lot of questions about uh, this seemingly binary choice between protecting the environment and promoting economic growth. And in the United States experience, that's, that's not true at all. You, you can do both. And I think the, the way you can do both is with uh, innovative approaches, both with technology and policy. And I'll talk a little bit about that. You know, um, we see policy playing a supporting role, but ultimately, technological innovation is the foundation of sustainable progress. You can enact any policy you want to nudge people, incentivize certain behaviors, or mandate and tax things all you'd like, but ultimately, if the technology is not good enough, and there isn't an economic case to be made, it's not going to be commercialized in a widespread fashion. And taking this approach um, is what I wanna talk a little bit about and how I think we've been successful in, in contrast to, uh, to some others. So in the United States experience on technological innovation, which is what DOE focuses on, we are really reimagining the role that energy efficiency can play in the energy system of the future. We know the energy system of the future is going to, uh, going to have to be more uh, flexible to incorporate larger penetrations of variable renewables like wind and solar it's going to be more individualized and it's going to have to be more resilient uh, to, to withstand the, the dynamic nature of both energy generation and energy consumption and how rapidly the energy system is changing. And so from a technology standpoint, this means we need our uh, energy related technologies uh, to be more adaptable. And we really need to take a, a systems approach to technology. The focus for efficiency can no longer be on individual widgets, particularly in a world, as was mentioned, where you have such low natural gas prices, which is a good thing for the world and helping to reduce CO2 emissions. But particularly when you have such affordable electricity, at least in the United States compared to other parts of the world, um, 
we have to reimagine the value that energy efficiency can add. It's not simply about using less energy for the sake of it, but it has to be about the other uh, valuable services that energy efficiency technology can provide. And uh, that requires a systems thinking approach. It requires innovative technology, the advent of new digital technologies, which I, I'm, I'm happy to see the uh, IEA's new energy efficiency hub beginning to uh, beginning to take off with. And I, I appreciate our, our, our partnership with, with, uh, with Canada and and others here um, on the energy efficiency hub and, and your leadership, Brian, and getting that stood up. But um, we have to make the value proposition because the um, advanced digital technologies that we're seeing potential for that, that are becoming commercialized uh, have the ability to allow us to operate our energy consumption more dynamically. Buildings represent 75% of, uh, of energy use in the United States, of at least electricity use in the US. And um, we envision a future through technological innovation where buildings are not just passive consumers of load, but where we can operate our consumption more dynamically to empower homeowners, commercial building owners, uh, manufacturers to um, increase the value, the services, the ancillary services that they can provide to the grid and service virtual batteries and serve with integrating all of these new technologies that we're seeing, wind and solar and storage and more natural gas, and in a way that enhances the affordability, reliability, and resilience of the entire energy system. And so this brings me to policy, because while I think technology is the foundation of sustainable change in energy efficiency, policy also plays a role. And the two ways that where I think this really, where we can really make the most impact through policy is uh, through policy innovation, but also in policy in, in, in uh, policy that protects innovation. And what I mean by that is, and what we've done in the United States is, you know, we regulate the energy efficiency of essentially every household product that exists. And we've done this for many decades. But what we're attempting to do now is develop a more agile rulemaking process that is responsive to the rapidly changing uh, technological demands and can uh, protect and empower innovation instead of being a hindrance to it. And so um, one of the things we've done with our energy efficiency regulations is pass what's called the, the, um, uh, the, the process rule, which takes a holistic look at the way we conduct rulemaking um, for the first time since uh, the 90s. DOE has uh, modernized its rulemaking process to develop a process that uh, targets the highest value energy efficiency opportunities, but does so in a way that is uh, transparent and streamlined and predictable for both consumers and manufacturers. So that's one way. The, the, the other way is um, through policy innovation in the form of non-regulatory approaches, including voluntary agreements. You know, sometimes with the, the products we're talking about, uh, the pace of innovation is too fast for government bureaucrats to keep up with, too, too fast for the rulemaking process. And we have to recognize that. And uh, fortunately, we have a couple of, of examples in the United States we can point to of using voluntary agreements. Um, the, the US US-based Consumer Technology Association partnered with uh, the US-based environmental organization, the Natural Resources Defense Council, to uh, develop um, voluntary agreements around set-top boxes. You might think, well, set-top boxes, what, uh, how much energy savings can you really get from those? But in fact, what we've seen over the last six years is that the set-top box industry, because of these voluntary agreements, uh, has saved $5 billion in energy costs. And this was a non-regulatory program that would have taken years to set up, but is now uh, bearing fruit and making real efficiency improvements that are, that are uh, making energy more affordable, driving down CO2 
2 emissions and, and keeping our, our industry competitive. So I think both policy, technology, finance all have a role to play. And the key takeaway that I want to leave you with is that we really believe, and it's been um, America's experience, that uh, technological innovation supported by policy is the foundation of sustainable progress on energy efficiency. So thank you very much for, for having uh, me today, Brian. And uh, I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Alex. It's great to hear that broad perspective, the focus on innovation, on systems thinking, and the kind of dynamism you bring to it. And I would say that the example of the voluntary agreements you just mentioned there is one of the best practice examples uh, cited in the recommendations of the Global Commission for Urgent Action on Energy Efficiency. And we look forward to seeing how that policy evolves in the future. Uh, let me bring in now our, our third panelist, um, which, uh, which brings a new perspective, uh, which is business and also uh, Latin America. And that is uh, Mr. Andres Garcia Ortiz, who's the president of Enesco, which is the Chilean national body for energy service companies and energy efficiency businesses. So Andres, thank you very much for joining us. And we're very keen to hear your opening remarks, please. Many thanks, uh, Brian, for your kind introduction uh, and invitation. So I'm very glad uh, to happy to be here. So I would like to introduce uh, some of uh, the things, uh, uh, actions I've been uh, doing uh, since the 2010, UNESCO has a private association representative of the energy efficiency products and services companies in Chile. So we have been working very hard together with our government in, and its agency to promote the energy efficiency behavior, best use and consume of energy uh, within the country and also how to avoid the losses in energy and energy transformation process in all sectors. We have got a range of positive outcomes since then in terms of uh, new jobs, health, security, resilience, and access. As an example, we can proudly show that our primary energy intensity has consistently been going, going down from 4.8 megajoules per US dollar in 2010, reaching 3.7 megajoules uh, per US dollar in 2015. Not improving quickly enough, but uh, we are still uh, working on it and uh, knowing there is a lot of room for improvement. Just to mention here that uh, just now in Chile, only around 25% of the industry have been implemented some kind of energy efficiency project. We introduced also and implemented ESCO models, which is another good thing. Uh, for energy efficiency in Chile. It's also final step for, uh, uh, sorry, resulting in a positive results for all sector, such as in hospital, hotels, industries, residential buildings, commercial sectors, etc. Also using government programs, uh, boosting the energy efficiency awareness in the society, trying to cash uh, all the benefits from this model, saving and financial speaking, of course. So we have a project of law of energy efficiency in Chile running on, uh, on its final step for approval in Congress, which among other action is considering institutionalize a national plan of energy efficiency within the framework of the Council of Ministers for Sustainability. It should be updated every five years according to the current scenario, of course. So inform home buyers about the energy consumptions of this uh, kind of apartment or houses. Promote uh, energy management system for both public and private sector, uh, electric vehicle chargers, uh, including hydrogen as a fuel, as fuel, since this was early defined as a product for industry use. As a country, we strongly believe that Chile will be an important player in this market due to our huge potential on that. Uh, by now, uh, with a huge health crisis ongoing, we are promoting creation uh, of state funds for soft credit and private funds, supported either by the state guarantees or insurance policies. Uh, those loans can be offered by direct or indirect financial institutions in order to boost investments in renewable energy, energy efficiency, and circular economy in Chile locally. Uh, thus, UNESCO has helped to promote well-designed government policies and new stimulus programs with efficiency consideration, with, which, which can quickly support the existing workforce, uh, creating new jobs and boost the economy in the range of key sectors, 
while keeping a track of long-term objectives of clean energy transition. We strongly believe that energy efficiency offers many win-win opportunities as all through the day has been said, uh, labor intensive projects that start quickly and are rooted in the local supply chains such as, such as construction and manufacturing sector. Uh, putting such projects in stimulus programs also has been support small and medium sized companies who are needing immediate cash flow or working capital to survive this crisis and not sunk in the trial. You know? So local government and private financial institutions are now looking uh, with interest the importance of the sustainable finance following the ESG rules and aligning their financial policies with them. Uh, now for all investors, uh, these new approaches that to degree us, it is a, not an option, we think. It is a duty and a responsibility towards its owners and clients. So Anesco, uh, it is being part of it, boosting the process and working together with the state bank to reduce the usual bureaucracy. So finally, we shall assume the responsibility to assure that the international public financial uh, flows reach last developed countries which are the furthest from achieving the SDG targets. Efforts need to be increased to make sure funds reach the countries which need the most than the most. So as an important player locally in the sector of energy efficiency, we are prioritizing them for sustainable economic recovery since energy efficiency brings other major benefits such as improved economic competitiveness and country and business uh, make energy more affordable and cheaper for consumers, and of course, uh, reduce greenhouse uh, emissions. So thank you very much, uh, Brian. I'm looking forward to receive uh, more questions. Thank you, Andres, very much indeed. And it's great to be reminded that when we talk about new approaches to efficiency action, it very much applies to uh, finance and business models as well. And I'm sure we'll come back to that. But let's bring in our fourth panelist, who's Michael Liebreich, uh, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Liebreich Associates, but I think known to everybody as a globally significant thinker and commentator on clean energy issues. And of course, from our perspective, a valued member of the Global Commission for Urgent Action on Energy Efficiency. And Michael, thank you for being an active participant in that process and let me hand the floor to you please thank you very much thank you brian um it's a great honor to be here it's been an honor to be uh, a commissioner on the commission set up by uh, fatih Birol on the iea uh, and it's a great honor to be on a call like this with so many uh, your excellencies and uh, and so many of the the people watching and attending I can tell you, I've been doing this for you know, nearly two decades, and the amount of uh, attention that is being paid to energy efficiency is unlike anything that I've seen before. Um, just the confluence of attention on this topic, uh, and I look at it like a kind of um, a combination lock. You know, if we're going to make rapid progress, then we need a whole bunch of things to come together and they need to come together simultaneously. You need uh, the technologies, uh, you need the demand out there in society. People have to be prepared to, you know, sometimes there's sticky uh, behaviors. They have to be able to change their behaviors. Uh, you need to have the right policies in place. Uh, you need to have the finance all coming together uh, at the same time. So we're certainly there, you know, in terms of the need, one thing that's absolutely clear is that if we're going to hit the targets of climate change for 2030, you're not going to do that on the supply side alone. You know, it's marvelous to see the way that cheap uh, renewables have taken off and, uh, and are penetrating the markets, but it doesn't matter how fast you do that, and it doesn't matter whether you retain and even build out nuclear, you're not going to be able to hit the targets of one and a half and two degrees uh, without looking at the demand side. Um, so that kind of societal momentum is, is definitely there. In terms of solutions and technologies, I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary uh, innovation across the board. Um, so whether it's the, in the buildings, the sorts of technologies that have been promoted by Bream and by uh, LEED certification and by Passive House, they're all kind of coming together. Of course, you know, LED lighting is the sort of poster child for energy efficiency. The appliances are coming together. 
um, electric vehicles. You know, you have to think about it. If you go from a fossil fuel vehicle to an electric vehicle, uh, particularly if it's uh, fueled by renewables, but even the normal electrical mix, that is a huge improvement in efficiency, a reduction in primary energy, because you don't have the thermal losses of combustion and, and, and the con as well as the conversion losses. Um, we're seeing you know, thermal batteries, we're seeing machine learning, we're seeing just the most extraordinary kind of flowering of, um, you know, um, uh, Minister O'Regan, you called it uh, radical incrementalism. I call it massively distributed innovation, which is what we need because there's no silver bullets when we need to transform every sector of the economy into something more energy efficient. But, you know, we're seeing it. Um, I think um, uh, Alex Fitzsimmons, you talked about um, technological innovation supported by policy. Absolutely, it's not either or. They're going to be working closely together. Um, I would put in my little plug for where I think we need some of that innovation. Um, we need innovation around flexibility in the electrical system, because as we get more renewables and they're variable, that puts a premium on the value of flexibility. And a lot of people jump straight to storage. Oh, we're going to need lots of batteries. We are going to need lots of batteries, but they are not going to be able to cover weeks and months where there might be low resource. But storing hot water is really cheap. So the energy efficiency, uh, we're now moving to system solutions. And uh, if we can get energy efficiency capacity and particularly heat to bid into flexibility markets, we're going to be able to drive the cleaning up of our supply side uh, even faster. So um, that's all kind of the, where, where innovation is going. It's fabulous. Policies, as I say, it's never come together uh, as strongly as it is now. Even before COVID, we were seeing uh, energy efficiency really moving to the heart of major uh, policy suggestions. And as a finance guy, what I was noticing was that we weren't talking about hundreds of millions or even single digit billions. Because when you talk about energy efficiency, if you talk about having to spend maybe $20,000 per housing unit to make it fit for the next 50 or 70 years, you multiply that by the amount of homes and you're into tens of billions really fast, even hundreds of billions. And the policymakers, I think, are finally talking in the right sorts of quantums. And you know, now you have uh, the COVID and the stimulus, and Fatih Birol is quite right that uh, energy efficiency has to be at the beating heart of any stimulus program. It is quick because the technologies exist. The skills are out there largely in the economy. Those people are not working. You put money in their pocket. You have an immediate benefit to the economy, but you also have the long-term multiplier effect of more efficient housing stock, office stock, industrial processes, and so the drag of inefficiency, the handbrake of inefficiency is removed from the economy. So the policy, seeing energy efficiency at the heart of the COVID response is very heartening. And I've talked privately and on these calls to policymakers from Canada, from the UK, looking at the COP process, uh, COP26 coming up in Glasgow, uh, talking to uh, uh, people at the EU, uh, across the board, we see energy efficiency at the heart, I really encourage that. Uh, please you know, keep your eye on the ball, you policymakers out there. And finally, finance, um, just to declare my, my hand, I am uh, an advisor to Sustainable Development Capital, which is a boutique bank based in London, operating around the world, scaling very, very fast. Um, the ability to do deals this year versus even three years ago or five years ago, and certainly a decade ago, is absolutely um, transformed. The money is there. Um, what I would caution is that with all this marvelous desire amongst policy, uh, the policymakers to promote this agenda, don't crowd out the private money. Private money is great at taking risks. It's kind of what we do. Um, but there are issues, for instance, credit risk. You know, there's a lot of energy efficiency you can do with businesses, industrial players, real estate owners, and the like. But if their balance sheets are stressed because of COVID, the big challenge is actually credit. So blended finance, credit, 
I think, Andrew, we're going to come and, you know, perhaps talk to you about that. But these clever mechanisms for providing credit risk against energy efficiency uh, upgrades is going to be extremely, extremely uh, productive. And I want to comment on the problem of doing energy efficiency against a headwind of low oil and gas uh, prices. You know, we're in an environment of low interest rates. Energy efficiency, like all clean energy, is investment up front. So it's very sensitive to interest rates. And if anybody tells, can tell me when central banks are going to be putting interest rates up, then uh, you know, I'll quit what I'm doing and I'll just, I'll, I'll just follow them around because they will be my new uh, guru and leader. I mean, we're going to see probably, certainly five years, probably a decade of low central bank rates. So if we're smart, we can get those low interest rates into the banking, into the finance uh, environment and low fuel prices can be outcompeted by low interest rates and all of these fantastic new technologies uh, and so on. So I'm incredibly heartened to see the 10 recommendations. Brian, you have played an absolute blinder. Um, the word I'm hearing is people are very enthusiastic that you've not wasted time reinventing the wheel. Uh, I love particularly recommendation four about finance, putting it at the heart of the process. Uh, and I think that we have to get on now, all of us, that combination lock is falling, click, 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 click into place. But we've got to get out there, all of us, individually, collectively, and do it. Thank you very much, Michael. Very inspiring indeed. And I think we'll, we'll just, uh, the one recommendation will be get out there and do it, and we can skip the other nine, possibly. Um, and colleagues, I have a number of interesting questions coming in here in the screen, but we have nine minutes. So, so I'll just say to you, the shorter your answers are, the more questions we will get to. Uh, so do pl please try and be succinct. But Michael, I'm going to start with you because you made a very interesting point at the start that efficiency has never been getting more attention or being higher profile. So in a few words, why do you think that's the case? I think we all, you know, just learn over time. You know, humans are smart. Um, and, you know, I think that when I look back to the environment, when I started what was then new energy finance, I mean, I didn't know the difference between biofuels and biomass. And I'll tell you, I was one of the more, you know, one, I, it was just, we were in a different world in terms of knowledge. And we have just layered on and layered on knowledge and case studies and best practices. And at the same time, of course, this drumbeat of the need to do something because of climate has been beating louder and louder. So it's more knowledge, uh, more pressure in a sense, uh, more sophistication in finance, more sophistication in digital technologies and machine learning, the ability to slice and dice problems and move risks around. And, uh, and it's just, I just think it's, you know, it's all of the above. It's just kind of, a, it's, it's hard, to, hard to say anything more smarter than it's just everything is falling into place. Thanks very much, Michael. Alex, I have a question here that I think might be best suited for you, which is uh, because you talked about uh, enabling innovation and you also talked about the central role of digital technologies and emerging technologies. But of course, these have dimensions well beyond energy policy related to data privacy, ownership, financial issues, regulatory issues. So how do you foster a whole of government approach to enabling that kind of innovation to take place? Uh, it, it's a great question. I, I, I think it starts, obviously it starts with leadership at the top and, you know, defining what, what the goals are. And, uh, you know, in the United States, we, we have a clear goal of economic competitiveness. That's what energy efficiency means to us. It's about um, being more competitive economically and, 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 uh, and being, on, being on the leading edge of technological innovation. And what that means for us, particularly because we have low energy prices, is the need to uh, reframe the value proposition of energy efficiency. As, as Michael pointed out, um, you know, it's, it's not just about using less energy. It's about the valuable services that energy efficiency can provide to an energy system that's going to require significantly more flexibility. And so not a lot of people think of energy efficiency as an energy storage mechanism, but when 75% of your electricity is in buildings, it absolutely can be. Your buildings can be virtual batteries if they are operated properly. And fortunately, we, have, we are beginning to have the technology to do that. Um, 
to, to create that value proposition, to make, ener- to make the business case for, for greater energy efficiency. Um, and, but it, you know, it, it requires leadership, both uh, policy leadership and uh, you know, technology leadership to actually see it get done. Thanks very much, Alex. Andrew, it's a question for you, because, and this is a point actually that Andrew made at the start, that ESCOs have worked very well in some markets and not in others, and you're clearly an example of, of success. So what makes a difference? Is it about policy? Is it about the entrepreneurs? Or why are ESCOs going very well in some markets and not in others? Andres, that Please. was for you. In, in- is that for me, Brian? No, it's for Andres, sorry. Apologies. Sorry. Sorry, could you say again, Brian? I couldn't catch the, 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 the question. Apologies. Why are ESCOs really thriving in certain markets in the world, but not so much in others? Oh, because I think it's, it's a matter of financial matters, you know. Uh, it depends on how the, the, the companies, how to get the, the cash flow to introduce the technologies. So as fast, as easy is for companies to get the money as easy as to get involved in the some kind of uh, escos models so uh, i really i really think that uh, as, as isn't at the center of the energy efficiency thank you and andrew since you were there because uh, michael said you know private capital understands mm-hmm. risk efficiency is a good business why do you need to invest in escos in europe why isn't private capital flowing by itself you know, the, 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 the business model uh, 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 shows in the ESCO uh, means uh, efficiency, uh, means that the earns of the saving can, can, uh, can uh, pay the bill for the finance, for, for the investment. So why to invest in the ESCOs? Because the, the, the efficiency of the savings is paid by the investments. So it's, it's, it's little free, you know. Thank you. Andrew, I'm not letting you away with my challenge to your, the fundamentals of your strategy. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, please, Andrew. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I mean, in, in a European context, it's a good question. Why, have, why has the ESCO market not taken off in the way it's taken off in other, in other parts of the world? Look, I think one of the reasons is, um, uh, I mean, is fragmentation, just, you know, 27 different legal systems, you know, We've come across basically uh, in public sector energy performance contracting, you know, basically 27 different contracts, you know, that, that you know, are being used. So, so there's been no development at scale of, of an energy performance contracting market in Europe. What we're trying to do is, is, is work with the Commission and to the, the 27 member states to develop a single standard contract, and in particular, one that meets the statistical requirements, because don't forget, this is one of the big incentives to do energy performance contracting by the public sector, is to get it off balance sheet, free up budget space for other priorities. So we've designed a, tem- a model contract that basically guarantees that if, if, you know, if the risks are allocated in the way this contract suggests, it will be, it will be regarded as a private rather than a public investment. I also think there's an issue of, of financial sector capacity um, in Europe, I mean, it just has not been a very lucrative and attractive area of business, but that, that is beginning to change. Certainly, we've started to see a lot of infrastructure funds coming to the market in the last two or three years with a particular focus on ESCOs and, and uh, energy performance contracting. So I think it's going to grow, but I think, it again, it, you know, in the finance ministries across 27 countries, it needs political will and support to do this. Otherwise, it's really not going to happen. Thank you, Andrew. And I think that might be a nice, a strong message uh, to end on. I have a nice set of questions here that we could take another hour on, but you've been generous enough with your time already. So I want to thank all of our speakers, starting with Minister O'Regan, Minister Tomas, Madame Guterres, and then our four panelists, Andrew, Andres, uh, Alex, and Michael. You've all been really excellent and inspiring. uh, And I definitely think we should do this again and continue this conversation. There's a lot of interesting issues here, but it's really gratifying to get 
this engagement from you all, this enthusiasm and this sense of dynamism and innovation, uh, and it makes me feel very optimistic for the energy efficiency sector. And of course, the IEA is your willing partner in this sense of dynamism and optimism, and we look forward to continuing to work with you all. And to our audience, I do want to say thank you for staying with us across the sessions, whether you joined us for one or joined us for six. I'm pleased to tell you we had over 30,000 views on our live stream across today. So I think we've reached a nice, healthy audience across the world, and it's because we've had such excellent speakers like the ones we have uh, just now. And please do continue to stay in touch with us. Our email address is energy.efficiency at IEA.org, or you can find me or us on Twitter. We're keen to continue this conversation. Uh, we'll be back for the sixth annual con uh, conference in about a year. But in the meantime, we hope to continue to work with all our member governments and partners, all our private sector partners. The Global Commission is a process that I think has a lot of uh, momentum, and we hope to continue to work with all of the commissioners in the future. Uh, it just it leaves it for me to thank my team here at the IEA, who've done a tremendous job over the last 12 and a half hours running a very large global conference under uh, testing circumstances, but I think that you'll agree they've passed the test. So thank you to everybody who participated today. Thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you next year. With that, I close the fifth annual global conference on energy efficiency. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Brian. Thank you.